<laughs> okay. Can I can can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention, please? So we're going to continue with mycobacterium. Yesterday we discussed mycobacterium TB. And uh, just keep in mind the structure wise pretty much the same as we discussed at length yesterday. And uh, today I'm going to discuss two more important uh, types of mycobacteria that cause human disease. Uh, firstly, I will spend some time on mycobacterium leprae and then mycobacterium avium. And let me start with the first one. All right. <clears throat> Leprosy, uh, I'm pretty sure that I've been seeing that in my lifetime, but there was a time historically when people, when they used to have this type of leprosy, people used to think and abandon them uh, in an island. And interestingly enough, uh, when I went to a American Association of Immunology conference like two years ago uh, in Hawaii, I was told one of the island was where they used to dump these patients. So there was like an island because they thought that this is the end of it. So they they were more worried of uh, passing it on to other people. So social out, outcasts, so to speak. But anyway, it remains as a serious disease and it's caused by uh, mycobacterium leprae. It's also called Hansen's disease. Um, as we discussed yesterday, bacteria do multiply very slowly. Incubation period is pretty much prolonged and you can get infection today and see the disease in 20 years. So, uh, again, the problem, the problem for these diseases is not the bacteria, but problem is your immune reaction to the bacteria. So that's like a keyboard over here, and you'll see me uh, repeating it over and over again. That was the clinical uh, presentation, but very advanced stage. So that's where we would figure out uh, how an advanced stage looks like. So they used to put them in the ship and dump them in an island for them to to remain there till they die. So if you look at the clinical picture, today we know that the patients can be divided into two major types, tuberculite and lepromatous leprosy. And uh, both of these spectrum of clinical picture present with a different kind of cellular immune response. So that's another important thing to keep in mind. Uh, we already discussed yesterday that MTB per se was uh, also very complex immune response where you got tons of cytokine production. We talked about TNF-alpha yesterday. I talked about uh, activation of phagocytes. And then uh, the whole idea was granuloma where you contain a obnoxious or virulent bacteria by layers after layers of cells. Now in this case, uh, again, it's gram positive, as we discussed yesterday. It's very strongly acid fast, lipid rich cell wall, as we discussed yesterday. And uh, the other problem with this particular bacteria is that we cannot grow it on artificial media. So it has a very fastidious, uh, very difficult uh, growth requirement. And uh, as I said just a while ago, the problem is that your immune system basically is unable or overreacts to cause the tissue damage that you see in particular cases. So let me begin with the uh, pathogenesis of that. And I would want you to recall your basic cell-mediated immunity. If you look at the clinical presentation, we usually have uh, cellular immune response and how is going to take care of bacterial count. So you can see from here, from this graph, if you have a very strong cellular immune response, you basically can eliminate bacteria. But as cellular immune response declines, you are unable to control bacteria. So you are unable to control bacteria. 
Now, if you look at the histological section, if you look at the content of bacteria, we divide that into posse. Posse means less as compared to multi. So, of course, if the immune response is strong, bacterial count will be less and you have posse bacillary picture as compared to when you have weakened immune response and you have high bacteria count in the lesions, you may have a multi-bacillary uh, response. So that's like a simple understanding that uh, depending upon what kind of immune response should you get. So uh, two major immune responses, posse bacillary and multi-bacillary, and both suggest in terms of bacterial count. I think having said that, you would want to know, uh, do we really have cases of leprosy these days? Or do we uh, see these patients? Where are they? Things of that nature. So that's epidemiology. So let's discuss epidemiology and as, as, uh, as I always do, and you can also see the difference that uh, I spent like an hour or so in the morning to look at any update from CDC uh, as a part of uh, continue, continued medical education it's called CME for the physicians and scientists that they have to not rely on what they were taught in medical school or what they think the information was. So they have to update their information and keeps on changing. So that's a key word for even pharmacies, pharmacy students as well. So they have to update and read the latest news which is out there in terms of uh, information. This, in uh, curriculum term, is called self-directed learning. So you have to keep on educating yourself, and uh, even if you have a license for practicing medicine and surgery, depending upon which specialty are you working in, it gets expired after five, 10 years. So you have to take uh, either a CME course or take a recertification of whatever you are licensed to practice in. So, having said that, uh, 300,000 cases were reported in 2005. This, this is an old slide. I have a couple of new slides, as I said, I downloaded this morning. Uh, the countries that still have that kind of picture that I showed you as an impact slide in the beginning, you have to visit India, Nepal, and Brazil. So these are the three places where you do have leprosy centers and you have these kind of patients and pictures and so on and so forth. But uh, interestingly, we do have 100 new cases reported every year. I'm just going to scare you up so those of you who are coming from those states have to be careful that it does exist over their leprosy. And... Uh, the other important thing is that of the two forms of disease, lepromatous and tuberculite, uh, lepromatous form of disease, but not that tuberculosis finds highly infectious. Lepromatous is highly infectious as compared to tuberculite. And if you remember when we talked of uh, tuberculite, I told you tubercle, which is like a clinical palpable thing. And if you dissect it and look at the histology of that, you will see granuloma. So whatever you see, walling off effect, a sealing off effect, where you have rims of layers around bacteria, that is basically coming from the response, granulomatous response. This is a chronic inflammatory response that happens in quite a few diseases. And uh, can you remind me of any other disease that has a granulomatous response? And we did discuss that as a part of immunology. Can somebody remind me of that? If there was such a thing that we talked about? Chronic granulomatous disease, CGD. Remember when I said the neutrophils can uptake bacteria, but they lack the NADPH oxidase enzyme that's required for electron transport chain. So oxygen is not produced. So the reactive oxygen species basically would not have that cytochrome and would be unable to kill the phagocytose bacteria. So there's an immunodeficiency in neutrophils. It's called CGD, chronic granulomatous disease. So that granuloma formation is a histological finding which you normally see. 
person to person spread by direct contact that's why the need for those people to be shunned away from society because people thought that if you touch them you're gonna get leprosy and then again you can also inhale so it can be aerosol as well so that's very specific for this particular bacteria now this is what the latest statistics are and as I said that uh, it is trying to uh, link leprosy with the AIDS and of course for a good reason because uh, the most important cell in cellular mediated immunity is what is the most important cell in cell mediated immunity CD4 positive cell so AIDS virus is going to deplete CD4 T cell and what is the normal ratio of CD4 versus CD8 T cell for a normal immune response? Two is to one. So for every one CD8, you have two CD4. But it, this is reversed in AIDS patients. So you have more CD8 cells as compared to CD4 cells. Now, if you have a problem where you have a uh, deficiency of cell mediated immunity and you require cell mediated immunity to control a infection such as leprosy so you can see from here that WHO reports that the countries with large populations such as Brazil and India uh, where they don't have a high rate of HIV infection but they do have large numbers infected so that kind of doesn't tie well because in this country as I said yesterday they weren't really bothered much to investigate MTB because they thought it's something to do with Asia and Africa and ever since they started having uh, AIDS epidemic and all AIDS patients used to get uh, MTB in this case uh, you can see that that kind of relationship doesn't hold well so the point over here is that probably Brazil India and then Central Africa I believe most of this there is where there's always MTM lepre present so they do have bigger centers and they have all those kinds of patients and facilities and so on and so forth okay again um, you will see same message that um, if you look at the new leprosy cases from 1991 to 2010 so there have been uh, resurgence in 2000 and then pretty much static but again the static means 200,000 cases and again you will see uh, new leprosy cases detected per 100,000 population more than 20 in these three important countries so that Nepal, India and Brazil okay now what do we do in this country and as I said that I'm just gonna give you statistics for USA and we'll also give you uh, like many a times you have a go between between you and a microorganism like a vector it could be a mosquito it could be a tick it could be rat mice so and so forth in this case is armadillo so there you go so what has happened is that they basically think that leprosy bacteria transmission from armadillo to man so that's what's happening in these states in US so all this southern part southeast part of United States they there are tons of uh, armadillos and they probably think that historically uh, it was brought by European immigrants when they came up uh, to this part of the world and brought some of the uh, exotic so to speak animals as well so you can see from here because what they found out that that was a way of transmission that people who are out in the fields they come across uh, armadillos they are the one they may get infected and then again uh, will have a human transmission so in this part of the world I'm pretty sure that it may be the same case in other parts of the world where vectors are there 
but for obvious reason probably nobody investigated or there's no point even going for that investigation with, when you got like uh, terminal stages of leprosy patients. So since we don't have that kind of terminal cases, so we can go and investigate and do research that how this back and forth transmission, so you can see back and forth transmission, uh, armadillo is like heart and wheel kind of a thing or which came first, hen or the egg. So that's what it is. So you, have, you can blame armadillo, but, but that is something that we have to be careful, especially uh, in this state, there are cases reported. So there are known cases where people have had contact with armadillos and have leprosy. But again, remember that leprosy, as I will present in the next slides, uh, can come from a very uh, earlier stage to a very advanced stage. Okay, a little bit of your immuno immunology recap. And again, uh, we'll give you that uh, mycobacteria is an intracellular parasite. We're talking about intracellular microorganisms. So let's say you get infected and then this acid fast red colored bacteria go into the macrophages. Then what happens next? So you can see from here, you can get infected by attenuated MTB, for example which basically suggests to you like BCG, as compared to a virulent MTB. So you can see in virulent MTB, uh, basically this bacteria is going to divide and then rupture the infected macrophage and will call full-blown disease as compared to this case over here where there may be apoptosis of infected micro, uh, macrophages but there will be a restriction of bacterial replication and you will have a good immune response to pretty much take care of that and your antigens can be, pro can be properly processed. So again, same pretty much picture of cell-mediated immunity. Okay, another view of the uh, possible mechanisms of tissue damage and remember tissue damage, why are we interested in tissue damage? Because tissue damage suggest disease. So you can become infected or may not show the disease. When you show the tissue damage, that's what you saw in this impact slide, that's where the problem is coming from. So again, you get exposed to M. leprae. There is a natural resistance or asymptomatic clearance. Good, you got a good immune system that pretty much will take care of all those insults that are coming from microorganisms. But if you have symptomatic leprosy, this is the spectrum that I just showed you in a very rough kind of draft. But if you want to look at the two extreme forms of the disease, as I said, tuberculide one end to a lepromatous the other end. And you can see from here that in tuberculide, where is a good cell mediated response, you get a granuloma formation, which is protective, and you will end a few organisms causing tissue damage. Compare that with a Lepromatous re response where if cell mutated immunity is not good enough, you may have humoral response. So humoral response is a weak response, an antibody response that would not take care of uh, these kind of uh, macrophages that have just engulfed or phagocytose bacteria. So you will have a, a picture where you have multi bacillary picture. But in between, there are borderline cases. So divide that into half. For example, uh, over here you can see borderline tuberculide as compared to borderline lepromatous. And then in between is like an equal distribution. So that's what clinically we see the picture. This is a Th1 response, good response, where you can eliminate mycobacteria as compared to Th2 response, which where you cannot. And again, both of them come with their different cytokines, Th1 cytokines and Th2 cytokines. So in this case, uh, Th2 cytokines basically are released and you have a problem here as compared to Th1 where you do not. So you can see from here, uh, there are a bunch of other inflammatory mediators that are released and uh, sometimes you can reverse this scenario because there's a humoral response. You can see antibodies uh, being made and neutrophils come around and you have both 
Th1 type and Th2 type cytokines release. And if this picture is dominated by Th1, you can go back and reverse the whole scenario. So you can do that and it can happen in some of the patients. Now, what is the problem here? Why did that person show what he showed, that tissue damage? The most important thing for M. leprae is that M. leprae goes for the nerves. So that's the most important thing, that M. leprae will go for your nerves and it will go and destroy the nerve, especially, you can see from here, myelin sheet. So it's like more of a, a picture, not true like multiple sclerosis, but more or less causing nerve damage. So that's the key over here. The nerve damage and uh, inflammatory mediated T cell mediated cyto cytolysis. So what we suggest to you is that your own T cells in response to mycobacterium leprae are also destroying your own nerves. So that's what the major pathology of this case is, okay? So a typical presentation for mycobacterium leprosy is gonna be neuropathy, effective your nerves. Okay, now very complicated scenario, but uh, again, something to do with, uh, with the drug formation, some, something to do with what are the options that we have. And as I said that, uh, again, I wanted to pick up the latest paper over here because I believe the information which is there in the textbook is pretty much old. And they just talk of very basic things. And if you look at the current paper, uh, 2010, they're talking about some of the genes and gene products which are involved in immune response. I just said that there's an immune response that causes tissue damage. And the question is, why do we have such an immune response? Why do people behave? They have a differential immune response. So they can take control of one microorganism as compared to other. So you can see there are two different um, M. leprae, and they basically are taken in by different receptors. And then once they go over here, then they basically are processed. So antigen is broken down, presented to T cell. So that's the little part of antigen is presented to T cell, and then the T cell will respond. Because remember, these are the T cells, they are causing cytolysis. So T cell mediated cytolysis means cell damage. And again, you can see from here, this is a Schwann cell. I just said the Schwann cell, what's the property of Schwann cell? You must have done that in nervous system. What is the property of Schwann cell? Louder. Yeah. I cannot hear you. That's the function, but what actually does it do? Schwann cells produce myelin. Myelin. So they are myelin producing cells. That's the most important thing. They are protective for sure. So if myelin sheath is destroyed, that happens in autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis, that is a very serious problem there. And that's what is happening over here. That is going to attach to some of the receptors on the Schwann cell. And then that's, remember that for us just to find out that with M. leprae, that information that M. leprae causes neuropathy is not enough. It's enough for you to know that, but you need to find out how and where so that you can come up with a drug plan, you can come up with something that you can treat the patients with. So you need to stop that happening. So you have to stop these particular receptors, which are PGL1, you don't have to remember that unless you wanna go in R&D in drug industry, but again, you can see that they are very specific receptors that these particular M. leprae cling on to, attach on to, before they will go and attach to Schwann cell. So these are very important, uh, like LPB21, for example, in this case, which is a laminin binding protein. So if you look at the structure of uh, myelin, it forms this laminin, like layers. So these are the layers over here. And this is uh, phenolic glycolipid, PGL, phenolic glycolipid. And you have this laminin binding protein. So these are the places where the drug are going to act to improve the life of those patients and also help uh, to uh, treat those patients. Okay. Now, if you look at the histologies, it's like acid fast stain of a skin biopsy, right? And you can see from here like A, 
B, C, and D. And A basically over here is a triverkalite. So it's a good response. You've got very few, very few posse bacillary as compared to Lepromatus where you have a lot of multi bacillary picture and then the borderline cases are in between. The most important thing you need to know is that uh, there may be a progressive increase in bacteria going from tuberculite to lepromatous. So you can begin with the initial picture. We have few bacteria and it goes, if you don't treat it, if you don't take care of it, it's going to go to the other extreme, which is a uh, lepromatous leprosy in this case. So this moves from left to right. Okay, so that's what the message is. So progressive neuropathy, that's what we call progressive neuropathy. So uh, if you don't take care of it earlier, it will progress to that. And a good uh, flow chart, you get exposed, you have a very good uh, cell mediated immunity, you can resolve the issue. If you have a poor cell mediated immunity, you have lepromatous response. If you have something intermediate, so you'll have all those borderline responses that uh, do normally occur. Now, the next slide, I'm going to show you the initial presentation of leprosy. And again, uh, just mark my words, and I may have said it many times, I'll keep on saying it over and over again, that um, skin diseases, skin rashes are the most difficult diagnostic test, clinical cases. So never go into that trap of uh, suggesting to the patients or whosoever to uh, start treat, tr treating those uh, lesions. Or, or You may consider them as rashes, but they may not be rashes. So they, these patients have to be investigated. And as I said earlier, let um, dermatologists take care of it. Be because just by looking at it, you cannot tell. It's, it's very tough kind of differential diagnosis. So you can see from here... This is an earlier presentation of tuberculite leprosy. So what you are basically seeing is there, of course, is a macule, just a little bit of slightly elevated uh, lesion, and a colorful lesion. Macule is not a papule. Papule is a little bit larger, doom-shaped. It's more of a, a little bit elevated, I would say, macule. And the most important thing is if it's a dark-colored person, this is hypopigmentation. So there's something happening with melanin, right? So uh, the most important thing in this case is if you ever rotate in dermatology or if you happen to see a patient, they will always ask you what they will do is that they'll take a pin and prick the person on the lesion. And if it is anesthetic, but also remember it could happen in diabetic neuropathies as well. So that is a typical case, anesthetic macule with hypopigmentation, tuberculite leprosy especially if you happen to be in Brazil, Nepal, and uh, India. So if you see somebody coming with that, so you pretty much have diagnosed in a very initial clinical case for uh, tuberculite leprosy. But remember, in tuberculite leprosy, this is uh, the less severe form. The person has a good immune response, and you see containment of those bacteria. As compared to lepromatous leprosy, you can see from here, they are diffuse infiltration of skin by multiple nodules. So M. leprae is presenting as a skin disease as compared to M. tuberculosis mostly it presents as a primary uh, lung disease. Again these are some of the questions that you may be asked how would you differentiate between an MTB infection versus an M. leprae infection. But again, there could be a skin tuberculosis as well. They could be. Okay, so you can see these particular lesions. And guess what is it in the lesion? It's teeming with bacteria. It is teeming with bacteria. There's a diffuse infiltration of bacteria. Okay, so what normally happens is that if you have preferred neuropathy, so your especially distal parts, because they are cooler, and for some reason, MTB wants to grow in cooler parts. So they go and make your uh, distal part, fingers and tips of, uh, you know, fingers, and aesthetic, so you don't see sense of pain, so you damage yourself. That's a typical presentation, and you can see that's what's happening in this case. You have a nerve damage, trophic changes in the hands, 
nerve damage, vasculitis and anesthesia. So that's, a, again, if you look at their, these people, and um, I mean, you can Google it, especially there is a leprosy center in India, and they have uh, all these patients, 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 presentations, presenting, uh, charity organization also working to help those people out. So these are the tr trophic changes that you normally see because of peripheral neuropathy. But also remember that uh, hands and face may not be the only part that are affected, uh, especially in Far East, Nepal, and other areas. You can also see uh, nodular swelling of face, especially in this case, you can see ear lobules, which become thicker, and the person has lost the eyebrows, and it's more like a thickening of skin. So that's another important feature that we normally see. But again, it's a spectrum. I just told you all the way from tuberculosis to lepromatis, there's a borderline tuberculosis, borderline lepromatis, and one thing in between. And uh, in Africa, for example, so you can see from here, again, facial uh, picture, and again, it's the beginning of that. So you can see swelling of the lips, swelling of the nose, ear lobes, and uh, eventually, you, if you're not treated well, you will end up. Uh, so what you're seeing is a cutaneous plaques. These are cutaneous plaques. They are infiltrated. And if you do, what they normally do is for diagnosis, they take scraping of the skin biopsies and then look and want to initiate the uh, chemotherapy, ASAP. So that's pretty much the picture. The other important things that you want to see if you want to compare lepromatous leprosy with tuberculite leprosy clinically, so you can see a typical, uh, this is a treated case for lepromatous lep leprosy, and you can see basically, again, this person had a nasal collapse. So nasal collapse is also considered over here. And on this one, he presented with uh, facial paralysis, left facial paralysis, facial nerve pal you know, kind of palsy. So that paralysis comes, uh, that normally happens in this patient, and there may be associated cornea damage as well. There's a good table for you to uh, remember skin appearance, nerve involvement, immune reaction, skin lesions, and acid forward bacilli. If you want to compare tuberculite with lepromatous, so you can see from here a few plaques, more plaques, the Th1 response, Th2 response. This is granulomatous, this is foamy macrophages, very few, pretty much the same picture. The only thing is that skin, nerve, and different organs are involved. How do you diagnose? Well, again, I said that it's difficult to grow them on culture. What they normally do is that they will have these armadillos. So they will take the scraping and kind of take this bacteria and inject them in their footpath. So footpaths then are, you'll see teeming with that. So unfortunately, that's pretty much uh, not a good way of doing it, but they may do that. Skin testing is required, and then culture is not useful because you cannot grow them. Okay, as far as treatment is concerned, uh, TB treatment, rifampicin and dapsone for six months, and you add clofazimine, um, especially for lepromatous leprosy, and sometimes you may and, uh, kind of extend it to 12 months. Again, uh, as I said yesterday, the, and I want you to remember the names of the drug at least, and how long the uh, treatment is for. And the most important message over here is that you need to promptly recognize and initiate the treatment before it goes from tuberculosis to lepromatis. Okay, let's move to the next mycobacterium avium. As the name suggests, this is a mycobacterium avium from birds that should cause problem to the birds. But if your immune system becomes to such a low threshold that let me put it this way, if you have a bird's immune system, right, you could be, you should be able to take care of mycobacterium avium, but your immune system goes to that level, so your immune system is not good enough to the level of even bird, and that happens in HIV, for example, right, so you get infected with such a mycobacterium that even birds can control, and one such is called Mycobacterium avium, okay? Again, gram-positive, lipid rich, pretty much the same, same picture. Uh, Sometimes you have asymptomatic colonization and it may go into color, uh, chronic pulmonary disease 
And as I said earlier, this usually happens in patient with the AIDS. Pretty much it. Once we see the patient, we actually treat all the HIV patient as a possible candidate for having a simultaneous mycobacterium avium infection. And you can see a picture of a tissue from an AIDS patient, and you can see teeming. This is a teeming, uh, low magnification, high magnification, teeming with mycobacterium avium. It looks like mycobacteria, but it's not mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's not uh, lepre, but it is that, okay? So you can see uh, these terms, keep in mind, uh, sometimes we call it a mycobacterium avium complex. The other name for that is MAC, M-A-C. So when we say HIV patient suffering from MAC, we are talking about mycobacterium avium complex. If you want to know about epidemiology, they are present everywhere, especially where TB is less common. You can acquire through water and food. So this is one of those mycobacterium that you can acquire from water and food. So that's again a distractor for you in one of the questions that which mycobacteria can be acquired by water or food. So that's one of them. And then again, patients who are at higher risk are the patients who have compromised immune uh, system, especially suffering from AIDS. Okay, or they may have a long-standing pulmonary infection. Okay, so diagnosis pretty much the same. How do we treat them? Uh, prolonged period with ethambutol and rifabutin. You can give a prophylaxis with the, to the patient who have AIDS, especially if they have low CD4 T cell counts and you can basically start uh, these uh, specific therapy called anti-TB therapy. And you, you should be familiar with some of the drugs that we normally use for anti-TB therapy. Okay? Now, uh, just a few slides to recap. Uh, we already discussed that yesterday, uh, tuberculin test. So all it tells you basically, because it's a mycobacterium anyway, so your body has it seen mycobacterium before or not. That's pretty much, but it would not tell you exactly whether it's a mycobacterium TB, avium, lepre, and so on and so forth, okay? And response basically would again be type four, uh, delayed type hypersensitivity. I'll put uh, some of the slides over there, and as I've been saying over and over again, uh, uh, those of you who have an online access to uh, Murray's textbook, they will see some other resources as well. And some of the facts that are out there that you cannot get away without knowing them. So this is like a meat for the questions. Uh, chronic disease, slow multiplying bacilli, and then again, incubation period is important, five years to 20 years. It affects skin, peripheral nerves, because of the upper respiratory tract and eyes. The message is that leprosy is curable. That's why we do not want them to become a social outclass and put them into a island. So that island doesn't happen. Not highly infectious, transmitted via droplets, and then again, uh, you need to have an early diagnosis, treat with multi-drug therapy, that's what we normally do. And uh, if it is untreated, of course, it's gonna be progressive and permanent damage to the skin. And then again, the official pictures, uh, figures that I gave you epidemiologically, uh, just updated by the year 2012, it was more or less 200,000, near to 200,000. And then again, some of the cases are there for you uh, to report. Okay, and then again, um, I'm not going to talk about that, but if you want to upload these slides, you should be familiar with some of the flashcards that are available on our, on, on, on site and on uh, line version of this, give you the basic idea of some of the memorization things that you may want to know. So that's all for today, and uh, 